Good morning, everyone. This is Nina Olson, and welcome to the second in our workshops uh, on reimagining tax administration social programs through the tax code. Uh, today, we have a really terrific workshop uh, with some really impressive speakers, panelists, um, and I'm not going to introduce them. I'm just going to introduce the host, the moderator rather, Les Book from Villanova Law School. Uh, my job is just to set up where this fits in. Our first workshop, we met with IRS personnel who tried to walk us through how a return is processed in the system. And we thought that was very important to kick off the workshop discussions because we, we need to know how the IRS operates, at least in its present state. And that will let us know the kinds of problems as we learn about the taxpayers and their characteristics, um, You know what kind of problems taxpayers might experience if we're going to deliver social programs through the tax code. This workshop is going to focus on the characteristics of the taxpayer population that is the subject of many of the social programs that go through the code. So Les, I will stop sharing and take this away and take my screen away and then you can start. Terrific. Thanks so much, Nina. And, and, and thank you for, for putting together th this is really just a tremendous, um, tremendous series and, and, and giving you know, so many different perspectives on ways to think about the um, the continued use of, of the the tax system to deliver benefits to our most vulnerable and and and, and as Nina um, mentioned, we're, we're looking today, sort of at a deeper dive, taking a deeper dive into the characteristics of of those um, most likely to benefit from um, from continued use of, of the tax system to deliver benefits, and we have just an, an all star group today to to kind of walk us through. Uh, these issues from from differing perspectives, but really creating a a, um, a very full picture uh, that will allow us to kind of understand um, not only the population but also some of the challenges that that are inherent in in delivering benefits using using the tax system, also opportunities as well. And so I'm going to start in in, um, in with the introductions in the reverse order in terms of who will be speaking today. Um, Elaine Mogg is is um, is a principal research associate at uh, Urban Brookings Tax Policy Center, and she has um, studied income support programs for low-income families and children for, for a long time. And she has experience in, in government at, uh, at IRS and GAO, and has, has advised congressional staff on the taxation of families with, uh, with children, and um, has been uh, um, co-director and, and and helped create the net income ch um, change calculator, which is allows which is a tool to allow us to explore trade-offs between tax and transfer benefits. And, and Elaine is, has has thought and 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 written and researched in this area for a long time and is, is really a thought leader. We're also fortunate today to have uh, Margot Crandall Hollick, who is a specialist in um, public at, at the uh, C Congressional Research Service. And her primary research area is individual and family tax policy and refundable tax credits, including the earned income tax credit and child tax credit. She, um, she's worked previously prior to CRS. She was in, in, at the Senate Health, Education, Labor, and Pension Committee, on the Subcommittee on Children and Families. She was also a teaching fellow at Harvard's um, Kennedy School, government focusing on microeconomics. And uh, she and I also were, were on a team together working with um, Nina Olson and the Taxpayer Advocate Service on a special report to Congress looking at refundable credits. So I've had the pleasure of working with Margo directly and I'm just thrilled that she's here to, to join us. And last but certainly not least, um, Hillary Hoynes. Um, Dr. Hoynes is Professor of Economics and Public Policy um, and holds the Haas Distinguished Chair in Economic Disparities at Cal Berkeley. And she also directs the Berkeley Opportunity Lab. Her um, research focuses on poverty and inequality and, and uh, food and nutrition programs and the importance of, of tax and transfer programs in low-income families. And her current uh, research is, is drills down deep into the um, access to social and safety net effects, children's later life health and human capital outcomes, an important topic and uh, certainly right on point for today. So. Um, 
I'm gonna, gonna kick it off with to, to Hillary, who's gonna, gonna put some of the, the context, uh, put in context the kind of broader social safety net in the US and, and um, help lay the framework for today's discussion as well. So um, Hillary, thanks so much for joining us at this very early hour out in California. Thanks so much for including me. I'm delighted to be here. Um, so as Les said, um, my role here to start is to um, sort of put the context of these important uh, uh, tax and transfer programs um, within the broader sphere of the social safety net in the United States and to try to, um, near the end of my remarks, I want to sort of tee up a real opening that I think the um, expansions in the um, American Rescue Plan, uh, which we'll talk a, a lot about later, uh, really, I, I think, make an important step in, in starting to, to fill that gap. So just stepping back to the very basics, when we say social safety net, what do we kind of mean by that? And typically, we think about two different kind of elements to the social safety net. There are the social insurance type programs, which would sort of prominently include social security and Medicare, uh, unemployment insurance, disability insurance. And those programs have two important features to them. One is that you sort of pay in uh, to some extent while you're working and gain eligibility through that process. And they're also mandatory uh, as a worker and paying in. Uh, but then once you kind of trigger eligibility, there's no screening based on need. So they're not targeted at the disadvantage. They're more universal in their structure. Um, in contrast, the second type of um, social safety net program are public assistance programs. And those programs kind of undo both of those characteristics of social insurance programs or, or their complements together. So typically, uh, public assistance programs do not depend on prior work experience. They depend on your current circumstances and your current need. And so they tend to be targeted based on income or assets and sometimes other sorts of demographic characteristics. Uh, and they're typically phased out as your earnings or income increase. Um, some of these programs operate through the tax system, some do not, some come in cash, some come in tax credits, uh, and some, a large share, particularly of the public assistance programs, take the form of some kind of in-kind benefit, whether it's health insurance or food vouchers or housing vouchers. So that's sort of the big picture of what the social safety net is in the United States. Getting a little bit more specific, um, this, I'm not going to go over this uh, in detail, but this um, graph here gives you just a snapshot view of, for 2018, so this is pre-COVID, uh, gives you a sense of how big these programs are relative to one another, uh, where big here is defined by the number of people that are participating, not the cost. So you can see that our health uh, programs are actually our largest social safety net programs, Medicare and Medicaid. Um, and uh, after that, uh, we see Social Security being uh, uh, touching a lot of Americans. And then after that is where we get to the programs that we're going to be talking about today. Uh, we've got the child tax credit, uh, the earned income tax credit, and also um, food stamps or SNAP is also very important, uh, but not what we're going to be focusing on today. So with that very quick sort of array of what the social safety net is, um, you know, who are the disadvantaged that starts to move us towards the topic today? And how are those safety net programs helping the disadvantaged? Um, and so based on uh, the, the recently released supplemental poverty uh, uh, rates released by census just uh, two weeks ago, uh, which cover calendar year 2020, if we start by just looking at broad age-based demographic groups, uh, we see that children have the highest poverty rates in the United States, um, with the elderly a bit behind, and then sort of uh, the rest of adults uh, between 18 and 64 having the lowest poverty rates. And just as a point of like history, uh, back before Social Security, uh, the elderly had the highest poverty rates in the United States, and that's really changed through policy. And uh, uh, elderly poverty rates really declined, and now the typical poor American is a child in the United States. Um, by comparison to other countries, our child poverty rate is very high in the United States. So this is like an OECD and uh, plus more uh, comparison. And you can see that the United States has quite high levels of child poverty compared to other countries. 
Diving down a little bit more beyond just the age categorization back to the supplemental poverty measure, who is poor in the United States? Well, we can see that people of color have much higher uh, rates of poverty um, than uh, white Americans. Um, Hispanic and black Americans have poverty rates at around 14% compared to 6.5% for white Americans. We see much higher rates of poverty among female-headed households uh, compared to um, married couples. And this will come into our discussion about uh, the tax policy. And very notably, uh, quite dramatic differences across um, um, uh, immigrant status uh, in the United States. So next, um, I really wanna do two more things. One, combine those two things together, the social safety net and poverty, because this is a conversation about uh, the disadvantaged population. And then I wanna kind of look forward um, to, to talk about where some of the holes in the social safety net are. So this is also from the most recent census study on the supplemental poverty measure. And what it does is it takes uh, current income and government tax and transfer benefits uh, for each individual in the data. And it one by one zeroes out. It's just a counterfactual of suppose this program disappeared and nothing else changed, how much um, uh, more uh, individuals would be poor. Or this is displaying about how many individuals are removed from poverty by the existence of this program. And so if you do that just at the very macro level across all Americans and across all social safety net programs, you'll see very immediately um, that Social Security is the biggest anti-poverty program in America, although it mostly affects the elderly, not surprising. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. The second is that these, again, just to remind our listeners are for 2020. And so they include those important um, CARES Act provisions and subsequent provisions during 2020. And what you can see is like remarkably, these um, economic impact payments or the stimulus checks were the second biggest anti-poverty programs um, in the United States for 2020. And obviously these would never have appeared on a prior report. And so this, just these numbers here are the millions of Americans who are lifted out of poverty by those, um, by those elements. After that comes um, unemployment insurance in a typical year that would be way down here in the list. So those $600 top ups that were the subject of so much um, debate and conversation back in 2020 were very effective at um, uh, uh, keeping folks out of poverty. Okay, so this then gets us to sort of what we're talking about today, and that is the refundable tax credits. So you can see when we look at the refundable tax credits, the earned income tax credit and the child tax credit pre-American Rescue Plan, because this isn't 2021, it's 2020, um, we can see that 5.3 million Americans are uh, um, removed from poverty because of those policies. And you can see, not surprisingly, that those are focused on children and kind of adult population of children. Mm -hmm. um, and you can then see after that, the other programs that are important for poverty, uh, anti-poverty policy, SNAP, food stamps, um, and so on. Zeroing in on child poverty, because that's sort of a particular feature of the population that we're talking about today that the earned income tax credit and the child tax credit have, have, are focused on. Uh, this is data from a National Academy of Sciences panel that I was part of that was tasked with uh, recommending policies uh, for reducing child poverty um, that incidentally had a child tax credit recommendation in it that looks um, very similar to what was in the American Rescue Plan. So this uh, is sort of doing the same exercise, but for a pre-COVID year. So there's no stimulus payments, there's no unemployment insurance in the picture. But what you can see is in a typical year, in a non-crisis year that we've just experienced, and with the perspective of focusing on children, you can see that the tax credits are the biggest anti-poverty programs for children in America. So this graph is expressing the data a little bit differently, but making the same point. And that is that without the tax credits, just a simple simulation with no change in anything, except zeroing out the tax credit, we uh, would uh, find that child poverty rates are six percentage points higher off a base of 13. So that is doing a lot of work in keeping children out of poverty. 
Uh, right behind it is um, SNAP or the food stamp program um, and, and you can see the rest. And so that is sort of the picture of um, the social safety net as kind of filtered through the lens of poverty in the United States. So I wanna make one more point about this and then talk about um, the gaps, where the gaps are, which I think will lead into the discussion that follows. The first is just to point out that the United States is not so exceptional in terms of its pre-tax and transfer poverty rate. And so this kind of lighter shaded, this is all still child poverty, um, and the lighter shaded part of these bar graphs is indicating the percent of people that would be poor if you just kind of ignored the, the government tax and transfer system, just zeroed it out uh, in a simple way. Yes, we're on the higher side, but we're not kind of an outlier um, in terms of pre-tax and transfer poverty. We 27% of families with children we poor based on their basically earned income only compared to 23% in Canada. But where the real differences lie is what happens after the tax and transfer policies are added in. And that um, is in part a kind of direct relationship to the fact that we just do less. So in that, I wanna just very quickly make a few points that um, identify what the gaps are in our current set of policies. And I think that there's four things to point out, and I'll show you a graph about three of the four. The first is that our policies are not universal. In particular, they leave out the two groups that are the biggest groups that are left out of our current system is sort of prime-aged, able-bodied adults without children. That's the subject of the, um, that would in part be addressed by the expansion of the EITC. And the second is um, undocumented immigrants. That's the first point. We don't have universal programs. Um, the second is very little of, the pro of our spending is in cash, particularly for the poor, very much dominated by in-kind benefits. And that's only gotten more the case over time. The third and really critical for the discussion that's right now happening is our safety net has become much more conditional on work over time. And the child tax credit would be a, a very important move away from that. Uh, and then finally, we don't spend that much uh, compared to other countries. So let me just show you a few graphs to sort of make these points. This uh, is a uh, figure from um, Elaine's uh, uh, Tax Policy Center. And this gives you the uh, 2021 uh, uh, earned income tax credit schedule. I want you to ignore the, the, the this lower, second to the lowest one in blue, uh, because that's gonna be the subject of our subsequent conversations. But the gray, uh, very small figure at the bottom is the pre-American um, uh, Rescue Plan uh, earned income tax credit for those without children. And you can see uh, you know, about a $500 maximum um, for that annual credit compared to $3,600 if uh, you were a, <clears throat> a parent with one child. So it is a policy that was originally designed to uh, target uh, families with children and really has very deviated very little from that over time, leaving um, huge benefits on the ground um, uh, that could be uh, uh, targeted at individuals without children. Number two, uh, going back to thinking about this kind of growing conditionality and the requirements on work, this really comes from originally welfare reform in the 1990s, followed by the rise of the earned income tax credit, um, led to a very different composition of spending between those in work and those out of work. Um, and then this has subsequently been built into other elements of the social safety net, such as SNAP and work conditionality and SNAP. And so you can just look at the graph on the left-hand side here. This quantifies spending across um, you know, the major um, social safety net programs for children and classifies that spending by the share that are going to families that are out of work versus uh, the share going to the families that are in work. And can, you can just see this dramatic decline um, in the 1990s and then really just kind of flat since then. So our bundle of benefits has really changed um, and that has profound implications for um, the amount of spending that are going to the very poorest Americans compared to those that are surely disadvantaged, but somewhat less so. 
And one of the like important elements of this that tees up the importance of the expanded child tax credit is a social safety net that's based on work, lacks basic insurance, and is also very a very little help um, when there is not work. Um, and so that's sort of uh, an important place to start with our conversation going forward. Finally, just to put in perspective our spending, you know, there's a lot of discussion about the size of the spending in the reconciliation package that these policies would cost going forward. Um, this is an OECD definition of family benefits, um, which would contain many of the elements that are being discussed in the, in the reconciliation bill. And you can see that we spend very little compared to other countries. And this is uh, as a share of GDP. Um, so I think I will stop there, um, stop sharing, and I look forward to the rest of the conversation. Thank you so much. That, that was really terrific. And, and, and it's, a, it's a nice kind of um, handing the baton to, um, to Margo, who, who's going to kind of give us a deep dive in, into uh, both the CTC and EITC and, 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 and kind of a little historical context as well as, as some of the, the, um, the, the reach of, of the changes in, in, in the uh, um, American Rescue Plan. So we're going to get you know, Margo's perspective on what is, you know, what is being done with the tax system in terms of delivering benefits to refundable credits. So thank you, Margo. Thanks, Les, and thanks, Dr. Hoynes. Um, for setting that up so well. So I am today gonna talk about the child tax credit and the EITC and some of the characteristics, just an overview of the recipients, um, the characteristics of some of the recipients, as well as looking at the information we currently have about the expanded child tax credit and what we at least estimate um, the impact of that will be. I wanna take a step back before I jump into what these credits are and just looking at the income tax system as a system, um, uh, in the to provide benefits generally, um, I think it's important to remember that the income tax system is often thought of as just a system to collect revenue, um, but it also provides billions of dollars of benefits, and we saw virtually a trillion dollars of stimulus checks during the pandemic. Um, and I, a lot of questions, I got a lot of questions about why are we making these stimulus checks as tax credits? Why are we doing this through the tax system? I think that's an important thing to keep in mind when we talk about these benefits is that the income tax system has this kind of point in time picture of what some households, what many households in this country look like. You know, what is on your income tax reform, um, income tax form, you are listing yourself, your spouse, your children, a variety of forms of income, earned income, if there's a desire to need to the benefits. Um, and uh, the income tax system is also generally includes people regardless of their immigration status, right? You're here, you work, you're supposed to pay taxes. Um, it's a separate system from the immigration system, um, but it's not a universal system. And uh, I think we saw that with the stimulus checks, right? This is in a system where we have information of every household in the United States, and that is by design. Um, in the 1980s and 1986 tax reform, um, we designed the tax system so that low income populations did not have to pay taxes and so they didn't necessarily need to they weren't required to file an income tax return because they didn't owe income taxes although they may owe many other taxes and if they work they certainly owe payroll taxes so that's kind of the tension we see i think going forward with this system designed to collect revenue it doesn't have information on certain populations um there was a 2017 cbo study that basically found that you know while up to 86% of everyone in the United States is listed somewhere on a tax return. Um, there's a significant portion, that 14%, that is not. They tend to be very poor. A lot of them are seniors who do not owe social security, you know, don't pay tax on their social security income. And so, again, don't need to file a tax return. And I think we saw some of the um, limitations of using the tax system when we we're trying to issue stimulus payments. And, and part of the way around that on this go around with stimulus checks was to use data from the Social Security Administration to issue those payments um, to eligible non-filers who weren't in the system. 
Um, but even though it isn't universal, um, I think it's probably, at least for all households, um, one of the most universal systems we have. Other countries, their universal system tends to be their healthcare system. Um, in, in this country, I think probably the closest thing we have is the tax system. But again, I think what we're going to focus on are some of the limitations and the people that it doesn't reach and it has historically not reached or struggled to reach. Um, so this is a picture. Uh, it looks very similar to the one you um, just saw on the EITC. This is um, for a long time. This was the biggest game in town in terms of tax, in terms of a tax benefit for low-income families um, with children, um, working families. Uh, the name is in the title. You had to have earned income um, to receive it. The benefit would phase in with earned income, plateau, and then phase out. So it was kind of targeted um, to the poor and also those who are near poor. So um, they might not they might not be in poverty by the measurement of poverty, but they were had income say below 200% of poverty. Um, and so what you can see here is a benefit amount that is conditioned on having earned income that is larger the more children you have. And is um, this little orange um, wedge is similar to the one you previously saw and was the um, credit for those uh, without qualifying children, and it was comparatively much smaller. Um, and you can also see that the benefit amount doesn't necessarily increase, um, doesn't double in size or increase proportionally by marriage. Um, instead, when you're married, what happens is the income tends to phase out at a higher level of income. So I think an important thing to take away is before ARPA, the tax code did provide benefits to low-income families. They generally had to work had, and have children. Those who worked and didn't have children received a, a relatively small benefit, and those who didn't work at all received um, very little assistance, if any, from the income tax system. So this is, uh, this is just an, another focus on what ARPA did for 2021 to um, the EITC. So you can see that across all income levels, it increased the amount, um, it, inc it tripled the maximum amount of the credit. This credit, like most all credits, except the child credit for 2021, is gonna be received as a lump sum next year um, when people file their 2021 tax returns. So we don't actually have data on the populations who are going to receive this and the, and the benefits from this temporary change right now. Um, so most of the rest of this discussion is going to look at kind of the prior law um, EITC um, and the characteristics of the recipients. So uh, I think it's always useful um, when you're looking at a benefit, in this case, these tax credits, to kind of see where its origin was and how it's changed over time um, to, got, to get to where we are today. Because as the function or as policymakers want the policy to have a different goal or do a different thing, you know, they generally try to change the structure of the policy to achieve that. And so policies can change over time as, as the needs of them um, change. So the EITC was actually um, enacted in the 1970s. It was a relatively modest benefit by today's standards, and it was not did not vary by family size. It has always been based on earned income, um, and it also didn't have any variation um, in the formula based on marital status. And I think that goes to the origin story of this benefit, where you know you can read the congressional record, and there are lots of different. Um, reasons put forth for this benefit, but I think one that emerges over and over again was that it was seen as a as a pro work policy to help get uh, essentially um, unmarried mothers off of the welfare rolls. It was a kind of a pro work way to do that. At least that was the intention of it. It was temporary um, for a long time until it was made permanent in the 80s, and then in the 90s we see a real shift in this program. At least what it's supposed to do. Um, so uh, you see more and more discussion about it being an anti-poverty program. So Bill Clinton famously said, you know, if you have kids at home and you work a full-time minimum wage job, you shouldn't be in poverty. This benefit will get you over that line. And so in order to achieve that goal, it needed to be modified to adjust for family size. So there you see much, a much bigger credit, a credit that is bigger if you have two, two or more children versus um, one, ch one child. Um, in the later, in the 1993, 
you, um, you see for the first time a credit for those without qualifying children at home, those who are often called childless workers. They may have children, but they do not have children that qualify um, for the child tax credit. So we generally see them as workers who don't have uh, related children at home. Um, and that credit uh, was enacted largely to offset an excise tax in the overall bill. It was not intended to reduce poverty among that population. And I think as Dr. Hoynes alluded to, it is, um, doesn't really do that. Um, and then in the early 2000s, you can see an adjustment for marital status, that higher income threshold before which the credit phases out. Um, so as the goals or as the intentions of the policy have changed, you can see um, the actual, the, the benefit and the structure change. Um, so, so going back to what I said before about um, those individuals, workers without qualifying children, the childless workers and the childless EITC, while they make up about a quarter of all EITC recipients, they re receive a very small amount of the overall dollars, so about 3% um, based off of IRS data. This is a table from that report that Les alluded to that we worked on in 2019 for the taxpayer advocate. And the top table shows that the participation rate of those who don't have qualifying children is 20 percentage points lower than the participation rate of those who do have qualifying children. And I think you know one of the reasons why is because it's a much smaller benefit. If you're working a full-time minimum wage job, you're probably going to get you know a few dollars, maybe $20 max from the benefit, um, depending, it, it adjusts every year for with inflation, like all of the other EITC schedules. But it's a very small benefit. It costs money, obviously, to um, to apply, to get these benefits. We don't often think about that, and I'm sure those that'll be in future panels. But many people use who claim EITC use tax preparers or software that cost money. And so, if you have a relatively small benefit, it might not be something you're going to be willing to shell out for, um, especially when there aren't other benefits that would um, get you into the system and get you necessarily filing a return. I, I will say that a lot of workers file a return to get a refund because they've overpaid income taxes throughout the year, um, but the participation rate still remains relatively low compared to those with children. Um, the bottom table here is just one kind of uh, one way to see, look at the work that EITC workers do. Um, sometimes we think that they might have one W-2 job, so they're an employee at one place all year, um, about 60% of EITC recipients have more than one job. It could be self-employment. It could be an extra W-2 job. So even though this is an annual measure and we can use survey data to look at um, the work of and the types of work that is done by EITC recipients in terms of how long and how much it pays, this does provide, I think, a pretty strong indication that there is a lot of work that is cobbled together and potentially cobbled together at different points of the year to get that annual measure of income that is used to claim the EITC. And so it's not like they have necessarily one stable job throughout the year. Um, so this is looking at the income distribution of EITC recipients, and it includes those with and without qualifying children. And not surprisingly, you can see um, that the lowest income don't get the highest benefit because it is phasing in at the lower income levels. And um, so they're getting uh, generally less than the maximum benefit. Um, and then the higher, um, as, the, as you go higher up the income distribution, the benefit it peaks um, or the, and the number of recipients peaks before declining. But you can also see here, especially in the um, bottom panel, which is millions of returns, that there are um, people outside of poverty. So, you know, between 100 and 200 percent of poverty who are also receiving a lot of benefits from the EITC. And then um, finally on the EITC, this comes up every once in a while about the marriage penalty in the EITC. Again, it was designed and targeted towards unmarried mothers. Um, and uh, there has been a persistent marriage penalty in it. It is the largest, the EITC is the largest driver of the marriage penalty among low income taxpayers. This is looking at um, the amount of dollars of the EITC that go to households in 2017. This is pulled from that same report I worked on with Les, and you can see, um, unsurprisingly, that a substantial um, share of the dollars are going to those who are unmarried versus married. Again, the EITC's value is based off of the total earned income of the unit, 
um, as opposed to being a per worker benefit. Okay, that was a that was a very quick going through the EITC. Um, and now I want to turn to I think what is getting a lot of attention, understandably, is the child tax credit. So the child tax credit um, is again another benefit for uh, taxpayers with children. Up until 2021, it was also conditioned on work. If you were low income, particularly you had to have earned income in order to receive even a partial benefit. So again, this is a, a picture of a benefit schedule. You can kind of see the, the that shape of phasing in, plateauing and phasing out, although a very large plateau region before ARPA. Um, and you know what you can see here is that ARPA, the, it looks like such a minor change on a graph, and I can't stress enough what a big change it is. ARPA um, changed, essentially it's eliminated the phase-in formula for low-income taxpayers so that they could receive the full and maximum benefit. So whether you have $0 of income or $10,000 of income or $100,000 of income, if you have one young child who qualifies, it's a $3,600. Um, per child benefit. In this case, I'm, I'm doing a, a young, I'm graphing the benefit schedule for a young child. I think the other thing that you can't see on this graph is that phase in, it, it looks very narrow. It's over a narrow range of income, but a lot of families live in that phase in. So we estimated that before the changes in ARPA um, in 2021, about 20% um, of families with kids lived in that phase in. There are other estimates out there that about a third of all kids lived in families in that phase in. So it's, even though it's over a narrow range of income, it's, it's a lot of families. Um, and now I'm gonna think, take you on a, on a journey to how we got here, which will not be with a table, but will this time be with, with graphs so you can really see how the form has changed as the function of the benefit has changed. So when it was enacted in 1997 and so went into effect in 1998, um, it was a relatively modest benefit. The child tax credit was really targeted towards middle income taxpayers. It was non-refundable, meaning that it was capped by income tax liability. A refundable credit like the EITC, for example, is not capped by income tax liability. And so it's available to low income populations who have no income tax liability, even though they have earned income. So, um, so yeah, a very small benefit. It looks like it's phasing in on the leftmost side. And I would stress that before 2001, what that represents is the fact that as income rises above a certain point, taxpayers have tax liability and the credit begins to offset that liability and it looks like a phase in of the benefit. Um, so in 2001, the credit was made uh, refundable using a formula based on earned income. So again, conditioned on work. And this was kind of like a baby EITC, if you will, but with one big difference, or I guess there are two big differences. Um, one of the big differences was that uh, a taxpayer had to clear a $10,000 earnings threshold in order to begin to receive part of the benefit. Then it phased in with earned income, the max before it phased back out. I think another thing that I you know, glossed over with the EITC um, and was true for a long time with this with the child credit, the EITC in the mid 90s had an SSN requirement on every member of the family. So if you had children and you were married, you all had to have SSNs in order associated with work authorization to get the benefit. The EITC, uh, the child credit in contrast, kind of began as a benefit that was available to everyone regardless of the taxpayer ID that they used. You just had to provide a taxpayer ID. Um, and so that allowed, um, at least theoretically, uh, people who were not eligible for SSNs to claim the benefit. So it got a little bigger uh, with the um, next Bush tax cut, the Jobs Growth and Tax Relief Reconciliation Act. There's a real theme for these things being enacted in reconciliation. Um, and then uh, the, the biggest change I would say before um, the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act and before ARPA was the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act. The last time we were in a economic downturn, this was the, um, one of the policy responses to it was lowering that earning threshold above which you could be start to become eligible for a partial benefit. So it was reduced from $10,000 in another bill, it was reduced to $8,500. And then in R, it was reduced to $3,000. And it's hard to see, but you can kind of see that little shift over to the left. That is reducing that, again, 
still phasing in um, with earned income for low income taxpayers. Uh, this is the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act and the change that it made. Um, you can see that the biggest changes it made were for the highest income taxpayers. So it, so taxpayers who had $200,000, $300,000, $400,000 of income who had been ineligible before because the benefit had phased out were now eligible for the benefit. It also increased the maximum benefit to $2,000 and it slightly adjusted um, that earned income formula to phase in the benefit for low income taxpayers. So it reduced the threshold from $3,000 to $2,500. Um, it caps the maximum amount that you could receive in excess of income tax liability. That's often referred to as the refundable portion of the credit to $1,400 per child. So you know, if you had zero income tax liability, the maximum you could get per child is $1,400 if you had sufficient earned income. Um, and then so that kind of makes that little notch and then it's phasing back in based off of income tax liability. I think the important thing to remember is when people talk about increasing the maximum amount of the credit, you know, tweaking that parameter, the, the bigger the maximum amount of the credit is, the more earned income you need using an earned income formula to receive that maximum amount of the credit. And so that was the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. And then here we are with ARPA, which as you can see, left the higher benefit amounts for higher income taxpayers in tax and really focused on increasing the benefit amount for um, the lowest income taxpayers and for moderate income taxpayers and you know you could probably say upper middle class the ARPA expansion the larger credit of three thousand dollars for a child six to seventeen and thirty six hundred dollars for a child zero to five is available to head of household filers so that's most unmarried um, parents, if they have income below 112,500, and it's available um, to married joint filers with income under $150,000, and then it begins to phase out to um, the pre-ARPA levels, those TCJ levels of $2,000 per child. So again, a lot of people live in that phase in of that TCJA, um, that kind of phase in area. I think that's an important point to keep in mind. And so you can see that this is has grown from a very small benefit really targeted towards middle income taxpayers to an almost universal benefit um, with a larger amount for low and middle income um, taxpayers and the largest increase in the benefit amount among the lowest income taxpayers, and it is not predicated on work. So zero dollars of earned income, you can receive the full benefit amount. Um, so we, like other people at CRS, and I think some of my co-authors are on this webinar, um, did a uh, you know an analysis using census data of the impact of the ARPA expansion on poverty. This was done using data before the COVID pandemic, so in a non-recessionary economy. Um, it was uh, it was using the trim model, which is um, housed at Urban, and it was crucially also assuming that everyone who is eligible based on the program rules would receive it. I think that's a big asterisk that we're we'll, going to focus on more later in this presentation is what happens when eligible individuals, you know, who are not in the tax system don't receive it. I think um, one of the things to take away here is that um, with families with children, uh, you know, a substantial portion of them are low income. So about, I think, if you look at the top panel and you do the math, I think that's about 47 or 48 percent of all families with children live below 200 percent of poverty. You see a significant number of them just above poverty and below 200 percent. And below is um, it is, is the average income for families with children within those buckets to kind of give you some sense of the income levels we are working with. Um, I think another thing to keep in mind that is not on the slide is that before the, before any needs tested assistance, before those non-cash benefits, um, before these uh, tax credit benefits, before SSI or TANF, you know the research shows or the estimates from the census show that 95% of kids live with um, families who do have earned income. I know that's going to kind of probably come up a lot in the next few days and weeks, but most children do live in a family that does have earned income. 5% live um, with someone who was in a family with no earned income. Those families tend to um, 
uh, have a, a head of household or someone in their household who's disabled or older, um, that that's just something I think it's important to keep in mind. So, let's see. Oh, sorry. So, um, the, the next few charts are just showing the before and after of the impact of the ARPA expansion, again, in a non-recessionary economy, assuming everyone who's eligible receives it. I think the thing I want to highlight about this chart is, is just that the benefit went from, you know, pretty widely um, received 84% to almost universal 96% are getting some benefit for it. But look at the bottom left panel with those individuals who are in poverty, right? We know that the main driver of this increase was eliminating that earnings test, that $2,500 a year that the taxpayer had to get to receive a benefit. So, you know, 52% were receiving it before, 48% weren't receiving it um, at all. And that is um, largely because of that. There are also other restrictions. Their child, there was a change in, um, in the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act that required that the child had a work authorized SSN. Um, so that also might be limiting it. And, you know, I can't obviously, all the families out there with 17 year olds who are newly eligible, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that that might be driving a small amount of this increase in the share of families receiving the credit. Um, so uh, the other, um, obviously the ARPA expansion, as we saw in that first kind of picture greatly increased the amount of the benefit for um, the increase was the largest for the lowest income population. So it's not really surprising to see that the largest increase, that kind of steepest line is occurring among the poorest, um, uh, the poorest families with children. But you can also see that up until about 300% of poverty, families are getting a, a benefit of over $5,000 per family. Now the, this is measured on the family level um, families can have more than one taxpayer in them. Families can be different sizes. This isn't necessarily, um, you, you should kind of interpret that with those uh, factors in mind, but you do see um, a benefit that is, it, while it's not necessarily the same size across all families, it's of comparable size for most families, except when you get to the higher income level. And finally, there, um, we measured poverty in two ways. We looked at the prevalence of poverty, looking at the change in child poverty rates from the ARPA expansion. Um, and on the next slide, we measured the depth of poverty by looking at something called the aggregate poverty gap, which we'll discuss. So here you can see that again, um, the, the poverty rate, uh, child poverty rates fell. They fell for every, um, for uh, children of all races and ethnicities. Some of those changes, um, were you know not exactly the same proportion as other changes, but for some of the um, for some of the groups that had the highest level of poverty, they were significant reductions. Um, and here is a, a, a kind of a, our research on the poverty gap. So the poverty rate, as many of you know, is is a binary measure. If you're below the poverty line for your family, everyone in your family is considered poor. If you're above the line you're non-poor, it doesn't really tell you about the depth of poverty. The poverty gap is one way to measure that. So it's the distance between a family's respective poverty threshold and the actual income they have. We sum it over all poor families. Um, and so this is a way to kind of look at the depth of poverty reduction. And you can see that the depth of poverty overall is reduced significantly by this benefit as well. Again, it's not conditioned on work, it's broadly available. Um, so it's going to uh, the poorest families and they're getting the largest increase in the credit amount. So, um, and so I just wanted to finish um, to, to tee up like future discussions in this series um, or in this particular panel and look at uh, full refundability. I think that is the, the big engine of what is driving the poverty impact when we're looking and it also benefits those who are near poor, um, providing them with a larger benefit. But I just uh, I just wanted to make a picture of what full refundability looks like and what the credit would look like without full refundability, because I think that's obviously um, going to be talked about a lot in the next few days and weeks. And again, it's a flat, it, it means that there's no phase in for this credit. It's a flat amount at the maximum. It just phases out for higher income taxpayers, but that provides the biggest boost in income to the lowest uh, income taxpayers. And this is pulling data from the Tax Policy Center, looking at the impact of full refundability across the income distribution of taxpayers 
This includes filers and non-filers. You can see the biggest boost over half of the credit value um, for the lowest 20% is driven by full refundability, but it still also provides an increase kind of higher up the scale among the, the second quintile, the second poorest 20% of taxpayers. So that's a lot, um, but I am going to hand it off to Elaine now. Yeah, thanks so much. And, and, and let me also just give a plug to, to you know, the CRS reports that have come out in, in um, over the last you know, couple of years focusing on, on refundable credits and, and are terrific. And, and as I think the only lawyer on the panel, um, you, getting the, the input and information in, in the way that, that, that Margo explained, and um, it, it's just super helpful. So, so thank you so much. And, and it really, it tees up nicely our, our, our discussion our next panelist, Elaine, who's going to talk about some of the administrability issues. And, and not only in light of, of, of um, some of the great detail that Margo presented, but also in light of the changing components of our of families in the United States and, and, and how that kind of meshes with what the IRS has traditionally done and perhaps what the IRS could potentially do going forward. So, so thanks, Elaine. Thank you. Um, I'm so happy to be part of this panel. I feel like I've learned a ton already. Um, so what I wanted to do is sort of talk about um, are the benefits we're building accounting for the families that we're trying to deliver benefits for. And so a lot of this is work I did um, with others at the Urban Institute, including um, Liz Peters, who's an expert in families. Um, and we sort of, we've tried to look at, is the tax system meeting people where they are? So, um, Without further ado, just a quick background. Why are we talking about all of these new giant benefits? I think you know Hillary did such a nice job of pointing out the poverty, but there's also this growing income inequality that's happening and um, growing volatility, which Margot also alluded to with jobs becoming sort of less connected to single employer, full-time, you know, year-round work. Um, we also um, had a moment during the last year where we saw multiple hardships just um, really rise rapidly. And it's sort of put into perspective what families are on the edge of. So food insecurity roughly doubled during the pandemic. We saw higher reports of missed and delayed health cares. Um, people were repeat reporting their inability to just meet their basic needs. And they also reported specific childcare um, issues were on the rise, like being able to pay for it and find it. And so I think it really highlighted that there's a lot of families that are living on a razor's edge. And, you know, if we want um, people to not be living in these precarious situations, we have to change how we build our safety net. Um, so the reason I think we sometimes look at tax programs is because we can address a really wide variety of needs with, um, with cash or you know, we could build programs to sort of deliver things individually, but I think the pro the problems got big enough that we started thinking about a little more um, cash-based safety net. So the tax system then becomes this natural fit because there's a long history of redistributing income in the tax system. You know, in the early days, it was done by taxing high-income families and not taxing low-income families, and that sort of you know facilitated the redistribution of income through program support. Um, and then there's been this growing emphasis on tax cuts versus spending programs. And while during the, you know, American Rescue Plan, during, you know, the pandemic, we certainly saw increases in spending programs too. Um, there's um, a lot of pressure um, on all of these things. And there's a political bet being made that refundable credits are going to be um, perhaps more durable for the long term or more politically palatable. And it's long been true that the largest anti-poverty program for working age families was nested in the tax system. And that's only gotten bigger with the um, advent of the larger child tax credit. But there's a real difference between taxes and transfers. And the big thing is the tax system generally thinks about um, people on an annual basis. And they think about people based on the legal relationships held between um, people sharing residences. And so it's um, quite different than some transfer benefits. So for example, a transfer benefit can be based on a household or you know, a family. So we see SNAP benefits are the people who live together and share meals. 
housing benefits are often, you know, the family unit that's um, living together. Transfer benefits also allow people to change throughout the year. And so if my child who receives SSI goes to live with her father, that SSI benefit can um, be transferred to her father so long as he also, you know, meets the eligibility criteria. Tax benefits don't typically think about moving throughout the year, although the um, Ways and Means legislation is trying to take a stab at doing that. Um, transfer benefits also determine um, your eligibility, and then they begin paying benefits. And this is somewhat contemporaneous with need. And then when eligibility changes or some you know, waiting period after that, the benefits stop. Um, taxes work quite differently. So taxes, like I said, are based on this idea of a tax unit. And I think it's important to know there's, you know, a lot of households that have multiple tax units. Um, a classic one might be a grandparent who lives with a mother, who lives with a child. That could be um, that three generation household could easily have two tax units. Another common example is the cohabiting couple. So I live with um, my partner. We may or may not share um, biological children. We're not married though. And so that means we are two separate tax units in almost all cases. Other thing is taxes are thinking about this annual um, measure of need. And so, you know, we look at your income throughout the whole year. And so as Mark will point out, income might be bouncing around but that's just in determination of your eligibility for the program. Your tax benefit is not bouncing around with that income. Instead, it's gonna look back at the whole year. And so essentially what you do is you live your life for the year and then you file your tax return the following spring and you figure out what's your tax unit. Were you married on December 31st? What was the age of your child on December 31st? Um, how long was the child in the household with you? Um, what's your legal relation, relationship to that child? And then you find out you're eligible or ineligible and the benefit is paid as part of your tax refund. Or in some cases, you might've had a little bit of withholding, you know, not taken out over the course of the year. So it's sort of paid um, in advance in that way. So just to put one more view on how important these tax provisions are for children, tax programs play an enormous role. And so this is work done by my colleagues in an annual Kids Share publication, where they try to look at federal spending on kids um, in lots of realms. And it turns out the child tax credit, the earned income tax credit, um, the employer exclusion for health insurance, the dependent exemption when it existed, all of that um, means that the tax system distributes a very large amount of benefits to children. It's something like 40% of benefits overall. So there's some real advantages to using the tax system. The first is it's administratively convenient. So the IRS has a lot of information already needed to calculate the benefits. So your um, wages are reported to the IRS, um, your social security incomes reported, and you're for other purposes already reporting marital status and some other types of income. So the IRS has a lot of the information it needs. And it's also, that means it's a little bit easier for families. So most families who are already interacting with the tax system, it's a relatively simple thing to go ahead and claim a child benefit or a work benefit through the tax system. It doesn't require you to go to an office that might only be open during your work hours and um, you don't have to make appointments and stuff like that. We fill out our tax returns, often with the assistance of software or a preparer, but it's you know, somewhat on an individual's time schedule, not an office's. There's also um, reduced and possibly no negative stigma associated with receiving tax benefits. So high income people file tax returns, they get refunds, low income people file tax returns and they get refunds too. And then there's also um, a political will that exists to um, deliver tax benefits, rightly or wrongly. Um, that is where um, Congress has been for a little while and where it um, continues to you know, put its eggs. But I think it's important to know there's disadvantage to this tax system as well. So um, folks who study taxes would say, number one, it diverts the mission of the tax system. The tax system is intended to collect revenue to fund the rest of government. And so when we start delivering benefits through the tax system, we're really changing its mission. 
But um, more important to what I think about is these annual payments. And those annual payments really fail to recognize how um, people with low incomes live their lives. Um, payments can be ill-timed for people who change jobs, lose jobs, or gain jobs. So your needs might become very intense and the tax system typically does not respond to that. It's also a very rigid definition of who benefits. Um, it turns out there's like 300,000 children in the United States who can't qualify for the child tax credit because they don't meet a residency test um, for long enough um, or a relationship test with the person who's taking care of them. And so people get left out of the system. It's a small number, but probably a number that we care about. And then prior to 2021, as Margot pointed out so eloquently, it largely excluded um, non-workers. So this annual eligibility is important consideration because there's a question about whether it's responsive enough for today's families. So on the left is sort of the model the tax system has in their head. And I think those of us who watch TV, you know, in the 1970s would have said, this is what family looks like. There's people get married and then they have children and they stay together for long periods of time. Um, but that's simply not how families live their lives right now. So something like 40% of all children are born outside of marriage today. So over time, more and more children are living in households where they may not be um, related to both um, people in the household um, caring for them. Um, cohabitation is on the rise, so couples are more likely to live together, join resources, maybe share caregiving responsibilities, but not um, officially get married, and the tax system doesn't really have a way to deal with this. There's also more multi-generational households, in part that's um, a little bit related to, you know, our changing population and demographics, where multi-generational households might be more the norm. So we did a little work on this at the Urban Institute. Um, and we're going to update these with the 2018 SIP very soon. But we've been thinking about how these family types have changed. And the important takeaway is that there are fewer families um, that are married couples with all biological children. And even if, and then there's also just fewer married couples overall. So the IRS has to think about what do we do when units are splitting and forming in different ways? Single parenthood is up a little bit, um, but the larger change, although it's still a very small share of couples overall, are cohabiting couples. And uh, um, the thing about this that's important is it's the more volatile um, family types that are increasing and the more stable family types that are decreasing. And so this is, needs to be on the IRS's radar. What are we gonna do? But more importantly, it needs to be on Congress's radar to make sure when they design a program in the tax system, they're actually meeting the needs of families. Um, so we also looked at how um, children are moving throughout the year. So at, with, if you're in a situation where there's at least one non-biological child, it's more likely to change across the year. So this is looking sort of at year over year changes. So for married couples, where there's at least one non-biological child, it used to be about 13% of them would change over year over year. And, and now that's grown to about 14%. In single parenthood, you see though um, a much larger share. So children, the point is that children are moving year over year across households and as non-biological children um, increase, um, then um, you know, we can expect more of this. So this is sort of you know, what's coming to the IRS. And then also that share of multi-generational families is increasing. And that means the IRS has to figure out where does the child belong? Do they belong with the parent or the grandparent? And how do we um, deliver benefits in a way that's equitable and makes sense for the family um, without also trying you know, to not increase gaming opportunities? Because if we think about resources being limited, we want to um, target programs to those um, children most in need. And we don't want to let you know, too many resources bleed out the top unless we're going to have some um, recapture. So then uh, besides the fact that families are changing year over year, um, 
income is changing year over year, and that might be fine. And so typically we think of tax payments as being um, annual payments. And how we think people used tax payments is important in deciding whether we wanna think about the tax system or if we wanna do what was done with the American Rescue Plan and even change how we deliver benefits in the tax system from an annual to a monthly system. So there's some evidence that shows people use their refunds to make big purchases. They buy durable goods like a refrigerator. They um, purchase <clears throat> transportation. But they also use them to catch up on bills. There's a really interesting study out of the Fed that um, sort of shows also this last one that people are using payments um, on recurring needs. So that might make you think this annual payment is not necessarily meeting people's needs. Um, earlier studies have shown there's a real preference for annual payments of these credits, but the more recent work has shown um, people once introduced to like a quarterly payment say, wow, it was easy for me to pay my bills. Um, I think I would um, like to continue that. I also think it's important to note that when the early studies on advancing tax credits were done, we had a more robust safety net that could deliver cash and um, other benefits sort of on an ongoing basis. That cash piece has shrunk quite a lot. And so now people are don't have a regular source of income if they're very low income. Um, and so it might mean that tax credits should be delivered more on a periodic um, basis um, because that transfer system sort of fell away. So how um, volatile are people's incomes? So we looked at data from the SIP again, and we have um, monthly income throughout the year. And we took the average income you earned over the course of the year, and then we counted the number of months where your income varied by more than 25%. So it was either 25% higher or 25% lower. We did not include um, the month your tax refund came. So we were looking at um, SNAP and food stamp or food stamps and TANF and earnings and um, those types of incomes that are reported monthly on the SIP. And what is somewhat alarming is 40% of families that are living under twice poverty have six months of the year where their income is bouncing up or dropping below that average by at least 25%. So the picture isn't that families are receiving, um, you know, low-income families don't have this steady income throughout the course of the year. Instead, their incomes are bouncing around. Um, early data from the um, Pulse survey out of the census showed that when the child tax credit payments started to be delivered monthly, um, food insecurity decreased almost instantly. And then there's also early data that show um, people are using those monthly payments to um, purchase food, but also pay off bills. And we see that even in you know, middle income families. And so it's not just low income people that have these bouncing around incomes, but it's also middle income people now as um, what work looks like has changed. But to balance um, all of this out and to keep in perspective in the tax system, there's been a long-standing concern over erroneous or fraudulent payments. So there have been improvements in income reporting to try to decrease these, um, these payments, but it's always gonna be an issue. And when there are concerns about erroneous and fraudulent payments, it can erode support for the program. And that's true of tax programs and transfer programs. Um, but then there's also, you know, um, interesting work that actually Nina's office did that shows that a lot of folks who are initially denied their EITC, when they went back and, you know, did a more careful audit um, and helped um, people, it turned out that most um, EITC um, recipients in this um, sample qualified for some or all of the EITC they had initially claimed. So it's quite possible that those reports of error and fraud are overstated and it's simply people didn't respond to an audit. And then the, 
last point I want to make today is that these errors are driven by complexity. And so every time we increase complexity in tax administration, we open up the tax system to more of these errors. And so we really have to balance all of the, you know, sort of problems I sort of think about with the tax system that it's a blunt instrument, it's delivered annually, and the tax unit is determined once a year. With as we become more flexible in that, are we making it more complicated for the IRS to administer or less complicated? And if we're making it more complicated, I think it's reasonable to ask questions about um, what we can do to simplify the tax system. And we wanna make sure we're not burdening individuals so much with these benefits that they're unable to take advantage of them. So I'm gonna um, stop at that. Awesome. Well, we, ha we have some time for questions and, and I'm gonna exercise the moderator's prerogative and, 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 and start us off and, and, and bounce right off of, of Elaine's kind of last comment comments um, and, and really kind of drill down in, in, in what maybe you could expand upon or, or have you thought about ways that the IRS can be better equipped to deal with some of the, you know, the, the changing family situations that you've described and, and your research has shown? What could the IRS do? And, and, and then kind of a related question is, you know, does responsibility, what responsibility does Congress have? You, you know, we, we, we talk about the IRS, but obviously Congress is, is is there with, with the drafting responsibility. Maybe you could speak to both of those related points. So I think of it in two um, buckets. There's an internal bucket that is on the IRS to try to fix, and there's an external bucket, and that's what is on Congress to try to fix. In the internal bucket, the IRS needs to be reorganized to have a group of people that are dedicated to delivering benefits. This is something that Nina has been telling us for years in her taxpayer advocate reports, and as complexity rises, it becomes even more important. It's just a different mindset. It's social workers reaching out to people, understanding how to find people. It's different than a compliance mindset when you're sort of going in thinking this person is, you know, guilty of doing something bad. The external piece though, is something that Congress has a real opportunity right now. And that is opening up data sharing agreements between agencies. There's very limited exchange of data. They could require um, administrators of transfer benefits to report data in ways that are useful to the IRS. Um, in prior attempts to match data from programs with IRS data, it's extraordinarily difficult. The timing doesn't match up, the unit doesn't match up, the data are not you know, in the same language as what the IRS needs. And so Congress could work on this coordination piece and I suspect other people have other ideas. I would love to add on to that if I could, um, because I think I wanna build on the second uh, um, element that Elaine was talking about with respect to um, data sharing across federal agencies, just to put in a little plug for um, the evidence-based policy commission uh, that I was on and has been kind of carried forward by the data coalition since then. But let me mention another reason why linking those data together can be so important for tax administration and reaching this population. And that is something we haven't talked much about in amongst the three of us is um, the fact that, you know, under current practice, these advanced payments of the child tax credit are automatically going out to folks who filed taxes in 2019 or 2020. And what we know from all of the in incredible information that Margot summarized <clears throat> for us is that the folks that are not automatically getting these payments are, are those that are the most disadvantaged. Um, and so, you know, they're the ones that have very low earnings and so on. And so there's huge value in bringing in, I would say, particularly data on SNAP um, and also on Medicaid, because those are then captured SNAP's even more important because we have more information about the family unit, um, as well as about other sources of income that would allow us to target effectively 
those who might not be automatically getting these payments. So it's not from the perspective of improving, responding to the complex families that Elaine was so um, articulately talking about, but for trying to make the CTC truly universal um, and, and capturing those who haven't been part of the tax system. Um, and, and you know when we sent out those relief payments, it was really critical that the social security folks who are non-filers, that data was brought into treasury. And so the automatic, the stimulus payments went automatically out to that group. Imagine if we had been able to do the same thing with the universe of SNAP beneficiaries. That would have been tremendous in reaching the estimated 12 million Americans who were eligible, but didn't automatically get those stimulus payments. Super helpful, and, and I know, um, and I mentioned in, in the chat, feel free to raise your hand or post a question in the chat and, and I'll try to, to, to navigate that. Um, Nina, your hand was up. Okay, so I just wanted to make a mention about um, the sharing of data as someone who's been inside the IRS and had to navigate multiple requests from non-tax agencies asking for the IRS to give them data. Um, I think Hillary made the point about um, receiving into the agency the data for SNAP and Medicaid, and I think that that would be very helpful. But often what happens, it's accompanied with a request, well, you give us our data. And I just wanted to point out that there have been, in the last year, two major cases in other tax administrations where tax data was shared with other federal agencies and the governments in the Netherlands, the government had to resign because of the abuse of particularly immigrant families that were based in this data, it was trying to use tax data to ferret out welfare fraud. And then in, in Australia, the government settled a class action of billions of Australian dollars because it shared tax data on income and that data was used to, to impute people's in earnings and then capture back and often in criminal contexts, um, you know, overpayments of, of welfare. And so I think it, we need to put safeguards and make it clear that this is not an exchange of data. This is a receipt of data that enables the IRS to administer this benefit. And there will be a lot of pressure on the part of the states. They want IRS data. And we have no control once it's out of the IRS's hands on how it is used by the states. There is no control whatsoever. Thank you, Nina. And, and if, if you could identify your um, organization as well when you ask a question, that would be very helpful. Um, Julie. Hi, and thanks again to all of you who are putting this together. Julie Kirksick, Community Advocates, Public Policy Institute in Milwaukee. Um, in my very unscientific uh, experience of uh, what's happened with the advanced CTC, one of the areas that I am hearing about from people um, is the, are people who did not have income tax liability or didn't understand that they could, since they didn't have income tax liability, they thought they couldn't uh, send in tax returns. All, that whole range of people and, and uh, the groups that were so very concerned about. But what I'm seeing is that because they were um, not generally uh, using the tax system. Now they're trying to get the benefit and they're uh, running into the fact that the a different parent has claimed, has already gotten and received the child tax credit. And they're saying, well, actually the child really does live with me. So I, I am not trying to say that this is a, a, a large number of people but I do feel like this is a group that we have a lot of concerns about. They, are, they tend to have um, very low incomes and, the, and the stress levels are so high. What in the administration, in terms of solutions, can any of you suggest? Because right now, all that happens if somebody gets flagged is you're not gonna get, nobody's gonna get any money for a long time. And uh, so I guess I'd just be interested in uh, suggestions for how we would decrease uh, that lag, time lag. 
I'm not on the panel, but I was just writing a note. This is largely a feature of the short term, you know, ARPA program because there is no dispute resolution mechanism. And um, even the fabled update portal is going to have limited utility when they finally allow people to change their marital status. But I think if you look at the current legislation, their attempts at a dispute resolution mechanism, um, and we're going to have a panel, a workshop later on talking specifically about due process dispute resolution mechanisms, et cetera, to that very point. Thanks, Tina. Really, I think you bring up just this really important point that there are a lot of people who believe they are appropriately outside the tax system. So it is a tall ask to figure out how to you know, bring them inside the tax system. Elaine um, Waxman did some surveys and she ran across um, folks who only had disability income and they were like, no, no, we've heard about the child tax credit, but we're not eligible for it because we only have you know, social security income. And I think there's gonna need to be some identification of all these various groups who believe they have been appropriately outside the tax system and now are being brought into the tax system. Again, I'm sorry, can I just do a follow-up then? Does the new law or the proposed laws or do other ideas have ways of balancing what Nina was describing where the IRS shares information that could be useful to other efforts in identifying the people we're talking about, we're concerned about, but does not, um, is not then targeted at uh, or being used in abusive ways. Is that a is that a is there a sweet spot in terms of implementation or uh, legal approaches to this? I think we can get a handle on we we could get a handle on this without the tax data, and that is you know in the social services domain, you typically know about kids who are co-resident with the parents. Um, and that is the key feature that is, um, is hard to document, honestly, um, for these families. Um, you know, the, I can't remember which person mentioned the report, I apologize for who mentioned it, the one where there was the, the kind of, um, not audit, but looking back at these folks that were originally determined to be ineligible and you have to go in and, you know, provide your supporting information. And, you know, what we learned is that there's a huge no-show rate for this group, understandably, difficult to, you know, get, get these appointments and with the rigidity of work and everything else. And secondly, imagine that you had to go and have the documentation to, um, uh, to uh, prove that you had a child co-resident with you for six or more months of the year. Like, what would those things be that you would bring? How would you get them in this world of not having you know, paper in front of you? So it's challenging. Um, but I think that with the context of say food stamp benefits, you know, there is the household resource unit and there is more um, social welfare um, involvement in the administration of the program that is going to help sort out who is likely to be the one who is eligible for the child tax credit when you've got parents that are not co-resident with one another. Um, so I think that this is a problem that could be made better even without the transfer of the IRS data out of IRS, which you know Nina raised as as you know we need to have we need to develop the right safeguards for that, when and if that becomes something that's happening um, in the United States. Thank you. Uh, I'll, I'll, in the absence of another question, I'll, I'll kind of take it out in a, in a, to a different place and, and, and go to Hillary, if it's okay. To, to uh, You've done a lot of research concerning the, the kind of the, the economic impact or the potential economic impact and, and including, you know, um, whether and, and to what extent the an expansion of the child tax credit would actually, you know, um, pay returns in the long run. And to, to thinking about, the, you know, there's, there's a lot of focus on the cost of, of, of expanding uh, benefits, but what about the, the, the benefits to, to child's welfare and out, outputs that, you know, I know you've looked at in, 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 in your research. 
Um, yes, I think that's quite important for thinking about the current conversation. And let's preface this by saying that, you know, when CBO does the scoring of these things, we've got a 10 year window, right? And um, unfortunately, for the purpose of bringing it concretely into the discussion in a sort of process oriented way, the, the benefits that we've learned about over the research in the past 10 to 15 years really take some time to accrue. Because what we've learned is that uh, when you provide more resources to low income families with children, the circumstances don't change dramatically for the parents over time. They're lifted out of poverty and that's, you know, can be important. But what we see where we, we kind of generate these real returns that begin to sort of pay off the cost of the program in the long run is when we think about it from the lens of the child and where they end up in adulthood. And so we've got evidence from um, the earned income tax credit, from uh, the uh, food stamp program, from Medicaid, um, and other kind of core elements of the social safety net that shows that when you do more spending of this sort aimed at children, they have higher accumulated human capital, like you feed your kids better and they're more likely to graduate from high school and go to college. There, you have a higher earned income tax credit, the child is more likely to graduate high school and attend college. That then has kind of profound um, uh, effects on from the government ledger standpoint in the case of more earnings and less spending for that next generation. And um, a, a Columbia University study attempts to sort of take all the kind of disparate research out there <clears throat> and make a prediction about the child tax credit in particular and showing that you know the policy largely pays for itself in the long run if you quantify those benefits. And other sorts of benefits that have been identified in the research have to do with more like the health domain, um, and so there's kind of less spending on perhaps Medicaid or Medicare in the future, and also in reducing involvement with the criminal justice system, which we know is a very expensive system um, for the various levels of government to engage in. So I think within that lens, there's a large argument for this being you know, good for families today, but a sound sort of <clears throat> investment for the government and our society at large. And it's encouraging that this seems to be coming into the conversation. Um, but 15 years ago, we wouldn't have had this evidence. It would have been a kind of natural thing to think might be true. Um, and we've thought about that for, for a long time around say preschool, uh, early childhood investments. We've, it's been longer that we've had evidence about that. And we sort of agree that, okay, it's gonna cost us some money today, but it's gonna pay out in the future. Well, the more we learn, the more we realize that the social safety net targeted at children, poor children, um, also has that same feature. And I think that's quite profound for thinking about the efficacy of these policies that we're debating today. Super interesting. And I guess maybe on the other side of it, or, or perhaps not, how do you think the potential expansion, or what does the research show around impact of expansion of the child tax credit on labor participation and, and labor um, more generally? Right, so that's that's the other piece. So, you know, I just talked about quantifying all these benefits. We also need to quantify the costs. And so the costs are not just the direct outlay, outlays on these credits and these advanced payments, but also any kind of change in labor effort that would be uh, a response to those additional payments. And I think the, the really important thing to understand about the child tax credit in particular is you know, there's, there's almost no way to distribute income at the very bottom without at least theoretically generating some um, impact on employment um, because of the kind of like profound kind of income effect that we talk about with respect to labor supply. But what we've learned from decades and decades of research on this, I mean, this is the most study, as I like to say, when I was a baby economist, all we did was quantify costs. Now, finally, 30 years later, as a grown-up economist, we're spending time quantifying benefits. It's kind of crazy, but we do have a lot of evidence. And I think what we know is that what generally tends to generate larger disincentives to work is when you simultaneously provide benefits and then phase it out steeply. 
Um, and that was, of course, a feature of our, you know, kind of original cash benefit system through AFDC. Um, and, and we find that these much more flatter universal benefits uh, tend to not do much uh, with respect to changing work. And in fact, the most recent generation of research, which kind of investigates things that the child tax credit would be very similar to in the sense of a predictable payment that's not huge, but provides a sort of basic insurance component, that in fact, that can actually lead to more work. And you might say, what? That's not right. For those of you who took economics, you'd think that's like against our basic model. But what the basic model doesn't really speak to is the fact that there are impediments to consistency of work, like your car breaks down and you can't pay for it to be serviced. Um, things around childcare and intermittent childcare that requires folks to have to move away from work because of inability to afford to go to work. And so we're starting to get some more important evidence that may even suggest that providing this kind of safety net could actually make it easier for folks to engage with work. That is super interesting. Thank you so much. And, and I, I guess I don't see any other questions, but I, I wanna give uh, the, the panelists an opportunity to, to, to if, if you'd like to, to respond or add, add some concluding thoughts and or um, there is some extra time if people do have other questions or comments. So I would just add on to what Hillary was just saying. Um, we're completing up a round of interviews with um, uh, families who receive temporary assistance for needy families. And we ask them questions like, um, do you know what happens with your taxes and your benefits when you work more? And universally, they it's very salient that they will be losing SNAP benefits. And it's on the top of their mind and they have no clear idea what's happening with their taxes. And in part, that is because they're so separated from, you know, I work now and then six months later, I get my earned income tax credit. And so I think in some ways advancing, you know, this child tax credit, so it's a steady payment, allows people to see there will still be money in my home if I, you know, lose my SNAP benefit because I'm working more, I'm still going to get this payment. And as people get experience with this, um, it'll affect work even less because there won't be all these fears associated with changes in work, changing benefits as well. I, I think from the National Academy of Sciences study um, from 2019, that was a real motivator for ARPA. They did estimates of the impact it would have on the number of hours. Um, and if you if you assume that um, all the low income folks would cut back on work, and even with their estimates, which I think we're using the term model is about an hour a week. I think there is that balancing that with also, there's been more recent work on the EITC in particular, because that was the biggest game in town before the ARPA expansion of the child credit on the benefits of actually um, parents and caregivers being at home and providing that care just in the brain development of children. So I think um, there is this, you know, how big is the effect and also is it beneficial to sometimes have that ability to be home and provide care. Um, I will say that the Ways and Means proposal um, does have a provision where you can look back and use older income. So if your income is volatile, you aren't, um, you're not going to necessarily lose it. It kind of disconnects it from your more recent income, but it does provide a sense of security. So if you, um, if your income declines or rather it increases, you're not necessarily going to lose um, the benefit because of that. It will be really interesting to see the data. I don't know if anybody's seen this yet on, since there was a look back provision for EITC in for 2020 returns, whether any of the data has come out as to how many um, taxpayers used the 2019 data versus, you know, the 2020 year for EITC eligibility. And then the other thing was the IRS wasn't able to program an automated look back that goes to, you know, people not knowing that they could do that. And it's not clear to me that the IRS is actually looking at them to make positive adjustments saying you could have gotten more EITC. And I think that's part of the change of culture that has to be in the IRS first, that they think of that as an affirmative duty, that their job is to get the maximum 
legal benefit to taxpayers for which they are eligible. And then once they uh, embrace that, that goal, that mission, if you will, um, then, the, then the programming will follow. And I'm not bashing them for this year because you know, this is a, was a heavy lift no matter what, but going forward, um, I think that that's absolutely essential, but the culture has to be the first, first part. Well, I, I think that that might be a good, good place to end it, kind of looking forward and, and for optimistically looking to changes at IRS culture. Um, I want to thank, thank the panel. So it really was terrific uh, discussion today and, and I learned a lot and I'm very grateful for, for your involvement and, and thank you so much. And Nina, do you want to say something about some of the next panels? Yeah, thank you. So our next workshop is going to be on October 18th. We take a little bit of a break. Um, and that one I'm really excited about. It's on design theory and administrative burden. So we've really learned a lot today about the characteristics of the population. And now we're going to bring some folks in who have been working on how do you actually, how can you consider administrative burden and make it less challenging for taxpayers as they they try to obtain these benefits. And so, you know, our panelists there will be Jim Greiner from the Abdul Latif Jamal Poverty Action Lab at Harvard, and um, Pam Hurd and Don Moynihan from Georgetown University, um, and then Emily Schmidt from um, the Department of Research and Evaluation in HHS. Then she has been running some really interesting research projects on this issue of you know, interacting with people, nudging them, and finding ways to make things easier. And so again, that's going to be on October 18th. I also want to say that we are actually are going to have um, in November a panel on organizational structure and culture. And that's when we really are going to be taking on, if we're going to run it through the IRS, what do we need? What does the IRS need to do? So um, thank you all. We will be, we have recorded this and we will be posting the recording and some of them and the slides. And I look forward to seeing you all for our next chat on October 18th. Thanks a lot. Bye.